Good evening, bells and bats, and welcome back to Spooky Stitches, the podcast that is 50% wool and 50% ectoplasm. My name is Sheena Peril, and I'm a writer and knitter from the Pacific Northwest. Um, before we begin, I do just want to apologize for any background noise that you might hear in this episode because our frog season came a month early. Um, that was unexpected. And while they are quiet at this moment, knocking on wood here um it, they come and go and they're very loud when they decide to sing the song of their people also i want to apologize for the mess in the background i have a small space so when i was doing the fashion show that you're going to see later in this episode i had to move everything around in order to make room for that and get a good shot and if i wait to put everything back before i film then I'm never going to film. <laughs> we have something that kind of resembles sunlight coming in today, which is the first time in weeks that has happened. So I'm going with the light. I figured that is the more important thing at this point. Um, I also thought that it would be fun to start out the episode with a card draw from one of my many textile themed tarot and oracle decks. I have a whole tour of my collection that I will post up above. Um, but today I grabbed the Unraveled Oracle, which I bought off of Etsy. I will try to find a link to her shop and put it down below. I still have the booklet, so I should have a link in here. But it's by Susie Gourlay, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. Oh, and it has her personal website right there. But I love these cards. I think that they're a lot of fun and I just love collecting textile themed decks, anything to do with knitting and crochet. So just shuffle these here and let's just do what the energy is today as I'm filming. Or better yet, what's the energy when you're watching this? Cards don't want to shuffle today. Whoa! Okay, I won't complain next time. So I'm going to go with this one because it's the only one that landed on my desk and it is unwind. So I hope that you are relaxed, having a chill time watching my video, grab some knitting, and just relax and give me a second while I pick up those cards. So the last few weeks I've been doing a ton of knitting because it's been really hard to do anything else. I am currently transitioning to a new medication and it's after being weaned off of another medication and this is week three of at least four for me on this. Um, so it's been peppered with things like stomach problems and mood swings and headaches and vertigo and generally just not feeling 100%. So I've been spending a lot of time knitting on my bed and watching Port Protection Alaska on my phone. Um, I don't know why, but I have this fascination with polar exploration and just like Arctic survival type of stuff. Um, I really love reading about Ernest Shackleton. Um, Amundsen, just all of the uh, different explorers that there have been. Um, I'm not a cold weather person at all. It is one of the reasons I moved to Washington, um, but I just find the series very easy to watch and calming for some reason. Um, but anyway, I've been plowing through some of my projects um, and making a lot of project progress on those. Um, which all of that to say that if you have been waiting for more author vlogs, writing videos, that kind of thing, um, and been disappointed by the excess of crafting content, it is coming. Um, but I needed to get acclimated to the new medication first. Um, ill me does not focus very well and depressed me is prone to doing things like deleting entire manuscripts and then emptying the recycle bin. Um, so... 
I'm trying to avoid critiquing my own work during this time when I know that I am not at my best. Um, so I need to wait for the chemicals in my brain to stabilize before I can go back to editing. I do have a vlog that I started working on right before the medication switch. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes here. I'm probably going to go back to that later today now that I'm feeling a bit better. Okay, so let's move on to finished objects. So my first one that I'm going to show you is actually from a couple weeks ago. Um, I did finally get the final finished photos and a little video clip of uh, the Google Muck sweater, which is the first in my Wednesday Adams series. I'll insert that right here. Um, I'm pretty happy with the way that this came out. It's not my favorite sweater that I've ever made, but it's not bad. I think that it fits pretty well and it looks decent on me. Um, but the one that I finished up more recently, I had a lot of fun making it. I really enjoyed it. I think that construction wise, it came together really well. It's really well made, but unfortunately it just doesn't fit me very well. So this is the Wednesday's child sweater. It is in Caron Simply Soft in black and off-white, and I knit it on a US size 7 or 4.5 millimeter Knit Picks interchangeable needle. Um, I had to do a lot of modifications to this because of the sizing. Jenna Ortega is a very small human, and my proportions are very different from hers, which ended up being a problem in this project, and that's where the fit issues come in. Jenna Ortega can wear like oversized crop sweaters and she looks like a cute little lollipop that is all dressed up and goth and when I try to wear something like that I just look like I'm wearing a circus tent. So the changes that I made to this sweater the original actually had three squares going down each side but because I had to make it wider to get the fit correct I also had to make them longer and that meant that I could only do two on each side. Um, I did do it in vertical panels, so it's a total of four, two for the front and two for the back, and then I knit them from the bottom ribbing up to the top and then picked up for the ribbing along the armholes and the neckline, and then I crocheted all the pieces together. I'm really happy with the crocheted seams. I didn't think I would like it because they are a little bit bulkier, but I think it came out looking so much neater than when I've tried to do mattress stitch or any other type of sewn seam on knitwear. So the major problem with this sweater, it obviously, it doesn't fit. Um, it's meant to sort of like hang off the shoulder. And I think that part of it is I might have made the armholes a little bit too narrow. Like they fit me, but they aren't quite as oversized as in the original so they don't sit the same way and they kind of pull the neckline wider which doesn't look right it looks like it's falling off of me because i have such narrow shoulders and i think part of that is also just that i have a large bust compared to my shoulder width so the bust size combined with the placement of the armholes just pulls that neckline too wide and it looks like it's falling off of me. It looks awful and I hate it. I don't know what I'm going to do with this sweater. I'm going to hang on to it until I finish the Wednesday series and then I'm probably going to end up donating it because in order to fix this problem I would have to go back, undo all of my seams, undo all of the ribbing at the top half of the sweater and then rip back the two front panels to the bottom of that v-neck, raise the v-neck and change the rate of decrease so that it's a smaller neckline opening and I'm still not certain that it would look good on me once that was done. So I would rather just donate it and give it to somebody who is actually going to get some wear out of it and enjoy it. Um, so if you have opinions on what I should do with it, if I should do like a giveaway on the channel or try to sell it or um, just donate it to charity, um, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I'm open to all of those options. If you do want it, it would look good on someone who is a women's one to two X US size, um, but who has normal or broad shoulders instead of my narrow little shoulders. 
So my next finished object is the Outlander Cape, which I did finish and it has moved on to its new owner. Um, I got some pictures of it. Ash requested not to model it for me, which is totally fine. Um, I ended up not modeling it because she's been wearing it. So it's been in use. This is based on the capelet that Claire wears in season one of Outlander during the boar hunt. And it is three strands of Barocco Remix Light held together to get this nice woolly texture. And I will have a full review of the yarn up on my blog in February. The pattern is improvised from the photos, much like the Wednesday sweaters. And if you want to know more about this process, I will leave a link to the video I just did on knitting without a pattern and designing patterns and what my process is for that. I started out on a US 4 for the collar and then moved to a US 6 and finally a US 8 for the bottom of the cape. This was the first project I got to use my Leica needles on and it was fun because the yarn and needles were almost a perfect color match. <laughs> but Ash really loves this cape. She, like I said, she's already been wearing it. So I'm really happy with the way that it came out. So the next piece that I finished, I actually haven't blocked yet. I meant to do it before this episode and I just totally forgot. I typically don't block my hats, but this one is meant to be a beret and I wanna make sure that I get that beret shape to it. Uh, so I am going to wash it and block it over a dinner plate just to give it that you know, flat shape to it. Um, I'm working on a piecework article at the moment that is all about the history of the beret, so I need a visual for my photographs and whipped this up. This is a standard recipe that I use for all of my slouchy hats, but I changed the slope of the decreases at the crown, and then, um, like I said, I'm going to block it over a dinner plate instead of just blocking it flat the way I normally would. And normally I would do at the end just a couple of rounds, one right after another, where I decrease every other stitch or every stitch. But in this case, I did symmetrical decreases every 21 stitches, every other row for four rounds, and then decreased every third stitch for two rounds, and then um, every stitch before I draw, drew the center closed. I sew through the live stitches three to four times just to make sure that it's nice and sturdy. And I used Fisherman's Rib for the brim because it is my new favorite rib. Uh, the yarn is Geektastic Fibers in their Superhero Sock Base. The colorway is Saturday. You'll get a better look at that later on because this is actually held double with a teal mystery yarn that I had in my stash. I have no idea what it is. But I suspect it's either acrylic or an acrylic blend and I used my number four Nitpex needles on these. Okay so let's move on to the whips. Um, first of all I have a project that I have dubbed Rainbows 2.0. Uh, if you're familiar with my avatar here on YouTube I'll put some pictures up here. This is a sweater that I originally made a few years ago and I've never been quite happy with it. It's an improvised pattern based on the pinwheel sweater by Shelly Mackey. Overall, I like how the first version came out, but it does have issues. For starters, yarn with really long color repeats wasn't a thing when I made it, so there are ends everywhere in this sweater. I also used a needle that was too large in the interest of getting it done faster. It is the recommended needle size for the yarn, which is Knit Picks Brava, but it was just too loose of a gauge for the project that I wanted to create, and it stretches out really, really bad. I'm also not happy with the placement or size of the armholes. I wanted to make them lower down and further apart in the new sweater, so it wraps a little bit better and then I can use the top part of the collar as a hood. Um, this would also go a long way to helping with the weight distribution and um, I need to make the armholes just a little bit bigger. Not a lot, but just enough so that it doesn't make my t-shirt sleeves do awkward things when I put it on. So this is the current in progress, which it's kind of 
bundled up right now, but I promise it is a circle. <laughs> I'm probably up to about 36 inches total diameter, and I need to get to 60 inches. Um, I got the yarn from Joann's. It's Line Brand Mandala in the colorway Gnome, and I'm working it it up exactly the way I did the original which is basically to make a giant round afghan and then you cut holes in it for the sleeves. Um, other than the colors the biggest change is that this yarn works up best on a US size 3 and I used a 7 on the original so that's a huge difference. <laughs> um, I should have been using a 5 on the original and actually I have it right here. been wearing this sweater a lot lately just trying to get a feel for like what I want to change how I want to make the new one different so here is back and on the original I the way that I knit the sleeves I knit them from the cuff wasn't from the cuff up it was from the shoulder down when I was trying it on um, I didn't pull the sleeve up high enough I guess so these sleeves are actually a little bit too short for me and that's something that I want to fix in the new one so the new one is moving along a lot faster than I thought it would um, I really like the way that it is turning out I'm already uh, at least halfway through my first ball of yarn, or my second ball of yarn, I mean. And these are, I think they're like three ounce balls that I got originally. I, uh, da, 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 here's the ball band. 5.3 ounces, 150 grams. So they're decent sized balls of yarn because they are acrylic and I got them from Joann's. Um, so they're going through pretty quickly. Um, and yes, I did say that I will have to cut the sweater to insert the sleeves. I've done this before. <laughs> um, I'm not as scared of it as a, I think a lot of people are. And I think that cutting along the curved edge is a lot more challenging than doing like a steak for one of those Norwegian sweaters or something like that because you're following the vertical. Um, but I can do a whole video on how I do that um, and get more into detail on that once I get the body of the sweater off the needles and can lay it out. My next work in progress is a pair of socks. I've actually finished one. I haven't cast on the second one just yet. I'm calling these the bubblegum socks and this is the Geektastic Fibers Saturday. Um, this is what the yarn looks like on its own when it's not held double and I had enough left over after that hat that I could make a pair of shorty socks. Um, I got this yarn at Red Alder Fiber Arts last year which is coming up again on the 17th of this month. I'm trying to get the rainbow sweater done by the 17th of this month. Not sure that's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to be there. If you're going to be there, look for a rainbow sweater, either the new one or the old one, and I would be happy to meet up. Um, but this is my basic toe up vanilla sock recipe. I had like a third or maybe even half a skein left after the hat, and it felt like too much to put in my scrap bag. So I just whipped up some socks. And for some reason, all of my handmade socks for myself are pink. I don't know why, that's just how it's happened, is that 90% of my handmade socks are pink. Okay, I wanted to have more progress to show you on the Eleonora stocking this month, um, but I realized after I had started making progress on the foot that I hadn't actually written down what I needed to do for the foot. So I need to go back to my reference photos and write down like where my decreases are, how many, how many repeats I need to make before I start decreasing for the toe. 
And my last whip is what I am calling the Foxy Hood. This is another one for Ash and another one using a new yarn. Actually, I'm reviewing this one and the Barocco Remix Light in the same blog post because they're very similar. Um, so I'm designing this one on the fly by looking at photos of the many variations of fox hoods that are available online. Ash requested one that took elements from several different patterns. Her favorite was actually crocheted, but neither of us really wanted me to crochet it. So I'm knitting it based on a crochet pattern. Um, she wanted it to be in more of a purple color instead of an orangey color. And I've got a tan for contrast. So this is what I have so far. It is once again, Fisherman's Rib, which is why I'm knitting it flat. I have not been able to wrap my brain around how to do Fisherman's Rib in the round yet. That's a skill I want to level up to, but I haven't gotten there yet. So this is the cowl portion, which will go around like here. And I want it to be kind of loose. And then actually this would be upside down. So it goes like this. And then once the cowl is done, I'm going to do a row of purl stitches so that it will turn. And then I'm going to double knit the hood with purple on the outside and tan on the inside. Go all the way up to the top, do a seam along here, and then pick up for the ears. And the yarn that I'm using for that one is Valley Yarns by Webs. It's their exclusive brand. And it is, the, the specific line is called Holly, which H-A-W-L-E-Y. And it's very similar to the Broker Remix. I don't think it's actually recycled. I think that it is new fiber, but I could be wrong about that. It's 50% cotton, 30% silk, and 20% nylon. So the Barocco Remix is 30% nylon, 27% cotton, 24% acrylic, 10% silk, and 9% linen. And the biggest drawback with the Remix is that it had this weird veggie fiber stuff in it. The only thing that I can figure is that it was part of the stalks of the linen that didn't get completely combed out. So you'd be knitting and like giving yourself splinters on it almost. It was really uncomfortable. So I picked out as much of it as I could. I still generally did enjoy using the Remix Light. It kind of reminded me of like a rustic wool. So in that way, I was able to deal with the veggie matter. Um, but the Valley Yarns is much softer. It drapes a lot better. And I feel like it's got just a little bit more, I feel like it's got just a little bit more elasticity to it than the Remix. So the Remix, after a while, it would hurt my hands to knit on it, but I do not have that problem at all with the Holly. And this is, oh, the other difference is that this is a light worsted. And this is, I'm pretty sure this is classified as a fingering. It's it's a number three because so I think that's fingering um so I held this one triple to get the texture that I wanted um it also comes in DK which is the regular remix and then it also comes in a chunky weight um as far as I know the holly only comes in the light worsted but I really like using this if I had to choose, I would probably go for this one over this one, unless I had a specific color that I needed, because this one doesn't have as many colors. This comes in 21 colors, this one comes in 28, and the Remix has more saturated colors. Um, the Holly has a few saturated colors, but they're missing a bright yellow, a dark brown, and a true black. Um, they've got a heavier focus on neutrals, and there seems to be a lot of very similar like grays and light blues. Whereas the Remix has a lot more variation in the colors that they offer. And I believe that they do actually have something that 
if it isn't a true black, it's close to a true black. Like it's a much darker gray than what is offered with this one. Anyway, like I said, I'm going to put a full review up on my blog. I could go very much into detail on those, but I'm going to refrain from doing so in this exact moment. And if you're not on my website, you should check it out because I talk a lot about chronic illness and history over there. And I also do things like yarn reviews. So if there is a yarn that you're thinking about, you can go check that out and see what my thoughts are. My specialty is non-wool yarns and looking for substitutes for wools for people with sensitive skin or allergies. So anyway, we're starting out with three skeins of this purple, which is color 16 crushed velvet. Um, it's purple and then it has like these gold tweedy flecks in it. Um, and the thing that I like about both the Holly and the Remix is they look like tweed, but the tweedy bits are fully incorporated into the yarn. I knit with a Knit Picks tweed yarn a few months ago or sometime last year and I just have kept having to pick out the bits of tweed because it wasn't fully incorporated and it just looked like lint hanging off my sweater which was not the look I was going for. So my contrast color is number 15. This is called Mahogany and it's just like a neutral tan. Um, well, it, it's maybe leaning a little bit more to the warm side. And then um, the flex in this one are a lot less noticeable, but they're just a lighter, cooler version of the same color. And if you look at it in the sun, this one does have a little bit more of a sheen to it from the nylon and from the silk. Um, you don't really see that on the purple on the darker color, but it is more noticeable on the light one but it's still just barely there. Um, so I am using my Leica needles in a US 4 for this. The recommended needle on the ball band is a size 6, and I'm just like, that's way too big. I probably could have gotten away with a 3 on this, but my 3s are currently in use for the rainbow sweater. So I used my Leica 4, and one thing that I noticed about the Leica needles that I'm really enjoying is as you use them they pick up the oils from your fingers and they become darker and it's just such a pretty color and a nice change um, so i think that these just look better and better with use now on to acquisitions because um i bought yarn in my defense i usually go on like one big yarn buying binge this time of year like between uh, Christmas and the end of January and this time it looks like I bought so much yarn but it's all for large projects that I'm working on so it's three projects total so the first one <sighs> I found these at Joann's this is a 300 gram ball of Lion Brand Mandala in the colorway Gnome because as the rainbow sweater gets bigger, the color repeats or the stripes get shorter. And then I found this giant one, which still keeps the same color progression. So this is going to go around the outside of the sweater. Once I finish up with my current ball, I'm going to switch to this one and it's going to help make the stripes a little bit more consistent and not make it look so crazy towards the edges. So I got two of those just in case. And then I've also got this whole bag, which has everything that I need for a sweater that I'm going to make. This one is currently a secret project. So I have 10 balls of Cascade 220 in the color 8400. They did not give me the color on the outside of the package and I don't want to open this just yet because I'm not ready to cast on, but it's a medium-ish gray. And then I'm doing a little bit of color work on this sweater 
and so I've got this color which I believe is called Shire this is doesn't want to tell me okay well it's color 2445 on the website they all had names but apparently on the tags they just have numbers go figure and then the last little bit of detail that I have is actually a red that I have left over from the original rainbow sweater this is Knit Picks Brava and I think it's Serrano is the name of the color just a bright red and that's going to be for a little bit of duplicate stitch that goes on this sweater i don't need a ton of it i don't want to buy a new skein um, so i'm just using up a ball of leftover and then the last thing that i'm not going to show you is the cat blanket which I've been making very slow progress on I haven't been showing it because it just looks the same week to week even if I have been making progress um, and I've been concentrating on other things that have faster deadlines than the cat blanket but the stitch the cat stitch uses up so much yarn I thought that eight balls would be more than enough to do roughly a full-size blanket and I had to buy eight more <laughs> so I got four more of the light purple four more of the dark purple and when those are gone the blanket is done that's that's where our cutoff is we're not going any further than that I'm not sinking any more money into it <laughs> oh and then the last thing that I bought which the Cascade 220 came from webs and I also I had to get the uh, the valley yarns also came from webs but technically ash bought this because the rule in our house is buy me yarn i will make you things so she buys me yarn and tells me what she wants and then i make her things which is how i ended up making the outlander shawl blanket cape thing for watch read play i'm currently listening to the heroine's journey by gail carriger I really love Gail's steampunk novels and I've been meaning to read this book for ages. I'm listening to it on audio and taking notes as I go and it's super informative. It should definitely be required reading for any high school level English or composition class. For the past six months to a year I have been trying to avoid falling down the American Girl rabbit hole that has taken over a certain corner of Costube. I was really obsessed with American Girl as a kid and the only dolls I ever really got into. Um, now I find myself being drawn in again and watching people make all of these adult size costumes to match their dolls. And I really want to make some accessories for my Kirsten doll. Um, I've started rereading some of the original books and I have thoughts. I have some really strong opinions about American Girl and Mattel at the moment and history and how it's presented in the books. So if you want a sort of rambly chatty video uh, where I make doll clothes and talk about nostalgia and the changes to the company, leave a comment down below because I would love to do something about that. Uh, I haven't been gaming much but I did start a new K-drama. It's called Love is for Suckers and it's a really cute show on Vicky. It's about a pair of platonic friends who are both like professionals and it's very clear that they're they're the end game like that that is projected from the very beginning but they have a really hilarious relationship and I love watching the two of them together. I've also been watching Only Murders in the Building which is fantastic. Uh, it's a little bit lighter on the knitting content than I was hoping, but I absolutely respect Mabel's desire to stab someone with a size 12 wooden needle. I think that's about it for me this time, so let's move on to our spooky story. In honor of Midnight Radio, which comes out on April 22nd and is available for pre-order right now, I'm doing a series on various cryptids and urban legends that inspired the stories. To start with, we are going to start with my favorite cryptid, Mothman.
On November 15, 1966, two young couples burst into the Point Pleasant, West Virginia police station in a panic, terrified of something they had just seen on the road. Roger and Linda Scarberry and Steve and Mary Millay had all claimed to have been chased by a flying monster with glowing red eyes as they drove through the woods outside of town. Though everyone tried to reassure them that it was just an owl, the four of them were insistent. A creature the size of a man had flown behind the car and above the roof for miles, tracking them through the TNT area, a former military base from World War II. While I haven't been able to verify the purpose or even the proper name of the TNT area's military usage, it's rumored to have been used for chemical and or nuclear testing, which has led to a theory about mutated animals in the area. Today, its official name is the McClintic Wildlife Management Area, and it covers 3,600 acres plus of woods and wetlands along the Ohio border. There are still explosives stored in the area in the decommissioned military bunkers, largely underground. For the next 13 months, Point Pleasant was inundated with more reports of what would later be known as the Mothman. Descriptions vary, some describing it as more feathered in appearance, while others described something more like a bat, but all insisted it had glowing red eyes and a penchant for following people as though tracking prey. As for the name Mothman, it's believed that it might have been adapted from a Batman villain at the time, Killer Moth. Mothman was blamed for radio and TV static, the disappearance of a German Shepherd, and a variety of small accidents in the area. It was reportedly seen standing under a tree outside a woman's kitchen window and flying in circles like a vulture over a cemetery while two gravediggers were working. Thirteen months nearly to the day after the first sighting on December 15, 1967, the silver bridge connecting Point Pleasant, West Virginia and Gallipolis, Ohio collapsed when one of the steel eye bars failed. This was a tragic engineering accident caused by an experimental bridge structure. Basically, the builders thought that by using stronger steel, they could remove some of the redundant chains in an eye bar chain bridge, so instead of each section being held up by six chains, it was only held up by two. This lack of redundancy meant that when one of the eye bars failed, there was nothing for that section of the bridge to fall back on and the entire thing came down. The bridge itself was about 40 years old at this time. Designed in the 1920s, it just wasn't able to hold up to the increased traffic of the 1960s or the fact that the cars themselves were much larger and heavier than they were in 1928. The collapse happened at rush hour and killed 46 people. After, it was said that Mothman was a warning about the impending disaster, which led to the book, The Mothman Prophecies. There's also a movie by the same name, but if you're looking for cryptic content in the movie, you won't find it. It's mostly about the tragic past of Richard Gere's character and his failure to cope with it. After the collapse, sightings of Mothman dropped off, though the news coverage didn't. It went from being a local phenomenon to something known worldwide, with rumored sightings happening on both sides of the Ohio River, accompanied by talk of UFOs. There were some hoaxes uncovered, but there were at least 100 sightings reported by December 1967 in both Gallipolis and West Virginia. Most Many believe that a disused bunker in the TNT area is where Mothman makes his home. But the sightings aren't limited to the 1960s or to Point Pleasant. In 2017, there were around 50 sightings reported in Chicago, and Mothman was also said to appear in Russia in 1999, just before an apartment building collapsed. Despite being a harbinger of doom, Mothman has his own fan club and museum and the small town of Point Pleasant has embraced their resident cryptid, creating an annual festival that includes a pageant in which contestants have to sing and dance the official Mothman song. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find a clip of this, and I'm highly disappointed. If you want to see it in person, though, the festival happens every September and will be held on the 21st and 22nd in 2024. If you can't make it in person, there's even a Mothman app that will let you get virtual tours or use it during the festival to get info. I was never a big fan of cryptids or urban legends growing up, but if Bigfoot is Batman, I love how Mothman is Nightwing. 
In adopting their resident cryptid, Point Pleasant turned him into cheesecake, and I love it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google the Mothman statue. I think it's hilarious. Also, Mothman totally beats Ohio's cryptid, which is the Loveland Frogman, but I'll maybe talk about those more in another episode. The Mothman legend was one of those stories that inspired me to write Midnight Radio in the first place, picturing a creepy, isolated town in the mountains of West Virginia with strange creatures in the woods. From there, the story expanded to include all sorts of creatures, including Sasquatch, ghosts, Tommyknockers, and more. If that sounds interesting to you, then check out the link below to pre-order the ebook of Midnight Radio. It's available for just 99 cents right now. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I post podcasts like this about once a month with other videos in between as my schedule allows. If you enjoyed this episode, con consider checking out some of the earlier ones here or subscribing so you can keep track of future installments. Liking and leaving a comment really helps me out too. Links to everything I talk about are down below, including a list of yarns used. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope you have something soft and fluffy to cuddle with. Ciao! If you want to know why I spend so much time working on my bed, this would be the reason.